Hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to the Kadzo language, a little known minority language spoken in southwestern China. We'll just touch on a few of the topics today, the language and people, phonology, nouns, verbs, syntax, and then we'll wrap up with a humorous case study about language change. Uh, the language itself is called Kadzo and the people as well. In Mandarin, this is Kajuo. And this is a little bit different than the term that was used prior to the 1970s. So the Kadzo themselves have changed their autonym. Previously, it was something like Gadzo with a different uh, Mandarin pronunciation and characters. The English spelling has also changed over time. So I mention all of these things because in the literature, you will find all of these terms depending on uh, when the literature was published. Locally, by the way, no one knows any of these terms. They're just referred to as the local Mongolians or the Tonghai Mongolians or the Yunnan Mongolians. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. The village they live in, Xingmeng, has a population of about 5,600. Xingmeng in Mandarin translates to prosperous Mongol. And that is also a fairly new term uh, that came about after the, the um, Chinese revolution in the 40s. It's located in central Yunnan. It's about 15 minutes away from the county seat of Tonghai and about four hours drive south of Kunming, the provincial capital. So again, right in the heart of central Yunnan. Hadzo belongs to the very sprawling uh, and large Sino-Tibetan language family. This is a very simplified view of the family. Uh, up at the top, uh, it gets divided into two separate branches. The Sinitic branch from which all the Chinese languages descend and then the Tibeto-Burman branch. So Kadzo is a distant relative of Mandarin and, and Cantonese in those languages. Within the Tibetan branch, we've got the Burmese E group. This was formerly known as the Lolo Burmese group, but Lolo was considered pejorative, so not used uh, anymore inside of China. Instead, those people refer to themselves as E, Y-I. Um, scholars often now refer to it as Mui, which is a reconstructed form of the, the word E. And Kadzo belongs to this branch. Now there's lots of different languages and dialect chains in this branch. It's a little bit um, confusing. Not all of these languages have been well documented, um, but it's pretty clear that Kadzo belongs to this group, but its position within the group is not so clear. The history of the people in the language is pretty interesting. Um, as I mentioned, the Kadzo uh, um, consider themselves Mongolians. For a long time, they have claimed that they descend from the troops that Kublai Khan brought to the region in the 1200s. The government recognized that nomenclature in the 1950s. Why are Mongolians in Yunnan, you may ask? Well, Kublai Khan was trying to conquer China in this time, and he decided he would conquer Yunnan first so he could attack China from the south. Yunnan at the time was a separate kingdom, not part of China. And the Mongol policy was to, uh, once they conquered an area, to have their soldiers settle and marry locally um, and continue to live for generations. And this is what they did throughout Yunnan. Kublai Khan eventually did conquer China, as you know, founding the Yuan dynasty in 1271. Um, but it didn't last long, less than 100 years. Although they, the Mongols held out a little bit longer in Yunnan, but eventually they were also um, thrown out by the new Ming dynasty. The Mongols fled in all different directions. One particular group of Mongols fled down into Tonghai Valley and basically hid out in the marshy swampland next to Chilu Lake. This is where Xingmeng is today, and those people were the ancestors of the Kadzo. Now, the lake shrunk centuries ago. The marshland was turned into farmland a long time ago, um, but the Kadzo were still there in Xingmeng. So this was a, considered a very out of the way place for a long, long time, and that allowed them to survive. But it also isolated them to a certain degree. Um, and so the language has evolved in its own way. Now, um, even though ethnically they are Mongolian or part Mongolian, um, the language has nothing to do with the Mongolian language family at all. It's definitely 100% Gui, as far as we can tell. Uh, no matter how you slice or dice the data, that's what we come up with. But it's also not a um, not mutually intelligible with any other Ngui language. And there are a number of Ngui uh, villages all around them, and they do not understand each other at all. And they, they do have a fair amount of contact. 
Um, so clearly language shift happened somewhere down through these centuries. Um, and presumably the Kadzo descends from some Inuit of variety that was spoken by the local wives of the Mongol soldiers, although this is a little bit unclear, but this would make sense. So very interesting. Now there's a benefit to being isolated in your own little village. So that meant that the language basically was, was untouched for a long time, evolved in its own way. But today that makes it um, a prime target for language endangerment. So um, Kadzo is still used every day in the village uh, by most everyone, but everyone is also fluent in Mandarin. And you cannot get through a whole day without speaking Mandarin for one reason or another. Um, children now are basically taught Mandarin first before Kadzo so that they know Mandarin well before they start school. This has been going on for decades. The children do learn Kadzo because they hear it around them, but more and more they're learning it imperfectly. You know, their vocabularies are not as large um, and their pronunciation is becoming a little bit more Mandarin, um, like Mandarin. And so we're seeing a slow erosion. Because the language is not recognized um, uh, itself as one of the um, official minority languages in the nation, it does not get any resources to help protect or preserve it. So there's no writing system still for the language. Um, it's not used in school at all, so there are no educational materials, and there are no media in the language. And in fact, the village is, in many cases, very modern. So um, everyone has a smartphone. They text each other using Mandarin. More and more people, the village is wired for the internet. More and more people have um, computers, you jump online, you play a video game using Mandarin, you turn on the TV, it's Mandarin, right? So the domains in which Kadzo is being used are shrinking more and more. UNESCO recognizes this, it classifies the language as definitely endangered. So the good news is children are still learning it, but um, we're seeing a slow, a slow erosion, certainly. The data that I'm presenting today come from my own fieldwork on the language. I've been working with the Kadzo for nearly 10 years now. Um, I spent a year in the village of Xingmeng and then two years of online fieldwork afterwards in order to write a comprehensive grammar, which was published in 2019. All told, um, I've worked with 70 plus speakers and have recorded more than 50 hours of audio and video. A lot of this focusing on natural discourse. So conversation, uh, storytelling, uh, instructions, trying to understand how Kadzo is used among the Kadzo themselves, capturing daily life as much as possible. So this work continues. So before I jump into the sound system here, I just want to point out that because the village is rather small um, and because there is no official version, there is no standard version of Kadzo, um, there's quite a bit of individual variation across the village. There's also one quarter of the village that has its own accent, which is rather interesting mainly just some vowel alternations that you don't find elsewhere. So there's, there's quite a lot of, as I said, variation. What I'm presenting here as the phoneme inventories for consonants and vowels is sort of a rounded up average across um, the various pronunciations that I've encountered. This is the consonant inventory. There is nothing uh, very unusual about this. Um, among stops and affricates, we only have voiceless versions. Uh, differentiated by aspiration, we do find some voiced fricatives. The vowel inventory is maybe a, a little less usual. Um, we have some asymmetry in the back vowels. So the mid back vowels, we have both rounded and unrounded version, but for the high back vowels, we only have the unrounded version. The rounded version, I believe, seems to have migrated to this v version, sounds very much like a V. Um, and so we find that as a, as a syllable nucleus. Also, we do not find the tensor laryngealized vowel or the laryngealized vowels in Kadzo that we find in the other languages of the family. Those have been lost over time. The one very notable and unusual thing about Kadzo phonology is its very large phoneme inventory. Eight phonemes in the language, uh, sorry, tonemes in the language, lots of tones, three even tones, five, five, four, four, three, three, two rising tones, two falling tones and one low falling rising tone. And here I have a minimal octuplet to show you what these, to what these tones sound like. Say, 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 say. 
say, 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 say. That was spoken by um, Quayle, my good friend and um, project uh, assistant. Now with a toneme inventory this large, you might expect quite a lot of tone sandy. And um, those of you who are not familiar, tone sandy is the process by which two tones, um, if they're the same tone and they come together, one of them may be required to change. That's the kind of widespread tone sandy we see all through the Chinese languages. We don't find that in Kadzo. Um, instead, uh, tone sandy is rather conservative. There are about 10 different patterns, but they are mainly um, uh, only exist in very specific constructions where they seem to have some kind of a, a function. They are part of the construction itself. None of them are obligatory, so we can't say that we have grammatical tone in Kadzo, and that would be very unusual for this language family. Um, but there's something that's sort of part way there. Anyway, too many and too complex to go into here, but just note that large tone inventory and very unusual tone sandy in this language. Now, when we come to nouns, uh, I should first point out that um, morphologically, Kadzo is an isolating or analytic language, meaning that there is very little morphology and um, words basically do not change shape for any purpose. So when we look at nouns, we see that they lack number, gender, or case. They do not um, inflect or change for any reason. There is a large classifier inventory that's used with them, and I'll talk about that in a second. In terms of uh, the word order, what we find is that all noun modifiers follow down. So here we have an example, ma, those two black dogs. And so the stative verb be black as the first thing after dog. Then we have the demonstrative, a numeral, and a classifier. The one type of modifier that precedes the noun is the relative clause, and that you see here. Um, we've got a noun, tobe mate, um, which means garment. Um, our relativizer is la, and so you see that in English, the phrase that you sewed is nege sa la, and it occurs before the noun. Noun classifiers, there are a lot of them in Kadzo. I've, I've counted more than 110. I'm not sure I actually have the whole list. Um, so a very rich system of noun classifiers. And if you're not familiar with noun classifiers, um, they work similarly to the way that measure words work with mass nouns in English. So for example, if you wanna talk about water or sugar, mass nouns in English, you have to, if you wanna talk about quantity, you have to add a measure word, a cup, a spoon, a, 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 a bottle, a, a glass, whatever. In Kadzo, all nouns must uh, have must be used with the noun classifier. Um, and every noun has at least one assigned classifier to it. And the classifier is usually related semantically to something about the noun. It could be its humanness, its shape, size, structure, or function. Now, if you are using a numeral or a demonstrative with a noun, then a classifier is obligatory. So here we have two examples, um, two buckets. Ba is the classifier for things that are held in the hand. And this field is the classifier that's used specifically for pieces or parcels of land. But these are not the only uses of classifiers. Um, if nouns exist without a classifier, and that is possible, basically that means that the noun is generic and without number. So we see that often, for example, in noun verb compounds. So we have two of them here, silva and za za. Silva means to buy books, but here the number, the type of books, really not important. This is really about the action of buying books. So the noun is generic and therefore no classifier. Za za, which literally means to eat rice, is the basic way to say, to, to say you're eating really anything. Um, the za has become so semantically bleached that you use it even if you're not even eating rice. So if you were to call me up and ask me what I'm doing and I'm eating noodles, I would still say za za. It just means eat at this point. But if you wanna talk about a specific noun in the world, then you're gonna use a classifier with it. You just saw that if you use a numeral with it, you're, you're specifying specific um, numbers, but if it's just a single uh, noun, 
then you use a classifier without a numeral. So that's what we have on the left-hand side here. So bait. bait is the classifier for volumes of books. If you want to talk about plural nouns, but you don't have a specific number in, in mind, there's another classifier you can use. Originally, it meant group. Now it's used as a general pluralizer. So subgo means books, right? But these are specific books in the world that you're talking about. There was one other rather unusual type of classifier, and that's the family group classifier. Now, um, other languages in the Ngui family have them. Not all of them do. They've presumably disappeared in many of them. Kadzo still has them, although they're not used so frequently anymore. But these classifiers encode family relationships. So very different than, than the other classifiers we were just looking at. Um, so here we have the complete list that are, still exists today. So ba, ma, pa, bie, lie, fe, ne, zimie. So ba, for example, the first one encodes father and another generation of relationship. So these get a little bit complicated in the way they're used and understood because you have to know a lot about the family of the person using them and use that context to understand what's meant. So let me. Give, show you some examples so you can understand what's happening here. Primarily, these are used with pronouns. Um, and so in our first example, uh, nang ba, ba again, it refers to the father relationship and one other generation. For every speaker, nang ba could be interpreted as my father and I. But if you are a male speaker, nang ba could also mean my children and I, because you're the father. Of course, if it's a 10-year-old boy saying this, then if obviously it's only going to mean my father and I. Or if it's an older man who has no children, and you know that, then obviously the phrase is also only going to mean my father and I. So you can see these are rather complex in how they're interpreted. You need to know a lot of information. Things get even more complicated when the numeral is higher than two, and use maybe one of these other classifiers. So nasi ne, um, here ne refers to siblings, either all female siblings or a mixed group of female and male siblings. The numeral three tells you that there are three people in total being discussed, but you got to figure out basically from context who, who all is being discussed. So if a, a man says nasi ne, then the interpretations are my two sisters and I, or my brother and sister and I. If a woman says na si ne, then the interpretations are my two sisters and I, my two brothers and I, or my brother and sister and I. So again, rather complex. Now these have, uh, you don't hear these often in um, normal conversation. Even among older speakers, these seem to have um, disappeared largely. I think that's because Mandarin does not have these, and so people are not used to using them. So another sign of the erosion that we're finding in the language. One other important thing to mention about nouns is that sometimes they're just not there. So Kadzo has uh, what we call zero anaphora, which is that once you introduce a noun in conversation or in a story, you don't need to keep mentioning the noun or even a pronoun. It's just understood that it's in the mix. Now, English requires us to use a pronoun always for that kind of a situation. But in Kadzo, the pronoun can be used, but it's also optional. So let me give you an example here. In this um, conversation, um, a younger woman is talking to an, a much older woman about what life was like when the older woman was young and was asking about what she wore when she was a, a girl and how she wore her hair, et cetera. So she responds with this phrase, zia which literally just means cut with scissors and then it's perfective aspect. Who's doing the cutting and what are you cutting? Well, that's understood from the context that happened before, so she does not have to refer to it. Notice that in the English, I have to supply these pronouns or the English doesn't make sense. So this is a big difference and it's very, very common in Kazo to find phrases that just have vowel, uh, verbs by themselves with no nouns or pronouns. 
because again, kadzo is this uh, morphologically isolating type of language, verbs do not change. They do not agree with any of the arguments. They do not inflect for tense aspect or modality. In fact, the language does not mark tense at all. Uh, there are separate particles that mark aspect and auxiliary verbs will mark modality. Um, and like the other Nguyen languages, and like all the Chinese languages, there is not a separate category of adjectives in Kadzo. Instead, stative verbs do that work of conveying attributes or descriptors. In terms of the word order of the arguments of a verb, we could call Kadzo an SOV language, although the order is a little bit flexible. So generally, um, verb was always comes last, so all the arguments occur before the verb. Um, typically, the subject comes first. Then if there is an object, it will come between the subject and the verb, and it will be the argument closest to the verb. If there's a third argument, what might be an indirect object, for example, that will come between those two. So here's an example. Uh, in English, this is she taught me kadzo, and literally in kadzo, this is she me kadzo taught. Now, there is some flexibility. First of all, the indirect object and the object, they can swap places pretty freely. Um, and um, it's really kind of up to the speaker and the general flow of information. Of course, with zero and Afra, some or all of these uh, arguments may be completely absent, right? So we do see that kind of uh, difference. But generally, this is the word order that um, you would expect to see. Verbs are very important, as, as you can tell, and of course, they're important in every language. But in Kanzo, um, we see that verbs often are uh, compounded in constructions that we call serial verb constructions. Two or three verbs may be stacked up together to describe a single event or maybe two closely related events. And let me show you what I mean by this. So um, the one event of construction, this we have multiple verbs that are being used to describe a single event. Um, some of them are used to describe some sort of directional or deictic arc of movement. So in their top example here, maldoli, gush, exit, come. Um, this, is, this translates to gush out in English, but the come there tells us that the action, the water, is gushing towards the speaker, towards the deictic center. If you were to use go as your final verb here, then it would be gushing out away from the speaker, right? So we've got directional uses of the serial verb construction. If uh, the last verb is a stative verb, so it's describing some state, then usually you're looking at some sort of resultative construction. So in this example uh, below, we have de guo, de guo. So um, de means to put and guo means to be wet. So the idea is that you are putting something in water in order for it to become wet, right? So that's a single event that's happening, uh, the making wet of something. So a resultative function. Now, sometimes serial verb constructions are describing two separate events, but they're so closely linked that you could use a, a serial verb construction. So in the top example, we're seeing this, this phrase, um, cha za. Cha za. So cha means to grab and za means eat. So if someone is talking about how they're eating food at a picnic, it's all you're using your hands to do it. And the grabbing obviously happens to ha needs to happen right before you eat. Um, so these are two verbs, two actions that are very closely linked. And the, the linkage is a temporal one. One happens before the other. In some cases, a serial verb construction will describe the purpose or the reason for an action. So that's what we see in the second example here. Gvung means to sell. Gv means to make. In this case, they're making a certain kind of um, uh, white liquor, and they're making it in order to sell. So uh, serial verb construction would be used in that case. And as I mentioned before, Kazu does not mark tense at all. It only marks aspect. That's pretty common for the, for the um, family. And I'm not going to go through all of these, and I won't show you examples, because it's pretty straightforward once you understand what the different particles do. Much larger um, inventory here, much more robust system than you would find in many of the, the Chinese languages. Um, Notice that we've got both realis and irrealis. We've got three different imperfectives, progressive, continuous, and iterative. They overlap, but they do have separate uses. 
some of them can be combined to create new meanings, and that's how we get the two inceptive constructions. So um, aspectual system used quite a bit. Um, not obligatory in every case uh, in a verb clause, um, but we, uh, we find all these are used quite a bit. Then we come to syntax. So as we said, morphology, there's not much of that going on. So a lot, all the action is happening in the syntax, we could say. The first thing to note is that we have a topic comment type of structure. And this is very similar um, for all the Chinese languages and also for the Mui languages as well. What this means is that often a topic is um, mentioned up top and then following you will have one or more um, phrases that refer back to the topic. Anything can be topicalized in Kadzo. It could be the subject, the object. It could be a time frame. Um, structurally, it could be a noun or a verb or an adverb. Um, this is used quite broadly in the language. Um, and to give you a sense of what this, how this actually functions, we can do this in English too, although we do it much less often. It says if you kick off every every statement you're going to make with something like as for X and then you make a statement or maybe a couple of observations about that, right? Um, the general topic marker in Kadzo is ni. And so here we have an example. Na sei ni, yi fa ma si, which translates as, as for my family, I know even less about them, right? So na sei, my family is topicalized. And then we've got the, the main clause. Notice that there are no nouns in the main, in the, in the main clause because of zero anaphora, and also because the topicalized noun um, is one of those arguments, and it's already been mentioned. Another phenomenon that should be noted in Kadzo is what we call pragmatic agentivity. Some folks call this optional ergativity, but um, pragmatic agentivity better captures this notion as Lapola has uh, talked about. So Kanzo has no case marking system, although other Tibeto-Burman languages do have them, especially the ones you find in India and the Himalayas. The only thing that could look perhaps like a case marker is gay, and this is used to mark agents in a clause. Now it is not mandatory at all. It is only used to resolve ambiguity wherever a speaker thinks that there may be ambiguity. And there are several situations where you might find this kind of ambiguity. First of all, if you have a verb where both the, the well, where, where more than one argument can be human, for example, <clears throat> where the subject, the object, or maybe the indirect object are all human, then it might be a little unclear as which human is doing what to which other human. So therefore you might wanna mark the agent, the instigator of the action um, with gay, or if you have an argument that's unexpected. So for example, if you wanna say something like a rock um, broke my window, we don't expect rocks to get up and move around and do things on their own. So that would be a little bit unexpected, but of course it happens. And so there you would mark the rock gay as the instigator, because otherwise you would expect the rock to not in be instigating anything. And then zero anaphora also creates um, situations where there may be some uh, confusion. So you may have a clause where one or more arguments is missing because of zero and aphora. And then that raises the question of what the remaining argument is actually doing. So here we have an example. Uh, the verb here is scold. And so typically, of course, people scold other people. But we only have one argument mentioned in this particular clause, the adults. So are the adults doing the scolding or are they being scolded? The only way to know is to look to see if there is gay or not. In this instance, there is gay. That tells us the adults are scolding someone. And in this particular case, they're, they're scolding the narrator of this story. If gay were not in this clause, then we would understand it as somebody scolded the adults, right? So gay is useful, but not obligatory, only used when pragmatics requires it. Another uh, thing to note and very common throughout all the Chinese languages and the Nui languages as well, is that you have a lot of phrase final particles. And in fact, in general, whenever you have tone languages uh, in let's say at least East Asian tone languages, 
Tone is busy uh, helping mark lexical meaning and therefore intonation is not gonna be used to convey speaker emotion like you do in English. So we have a bunch of phrase final particles that help express speaker opinion and emotion. So for example, there are 12 different particles used to ask questions in Kadzo. And you choose a particle depending on the type of question you wanna ask, the aspect of the situation you're asking about, and then the speaker's ideas about the question itself. Is it a good question? Is it a bad question? And whether there's gonna be an answer or a good answer. So these different particles combine these different types of meaning together to allow you to ask all kinds of questions in all kinds of situations. Similarly, we've got um, particles for emphasis. There are uh, roughly nine of them. And also they combine different aspects of meaning. One uh, grammatical aspect of the situation, also the type and degree of emphasis, and the speaker's ideas about whether they think the listener is gonna agree with their emphatic statement or not. So phrase final particles, very, very common not obligatory always, but very common, uh, and you'll see them in clause after clause. So now with that short introduction, um, you can take a look at a roadmap of what a clause looks like in Kodzo and understand how these all work together. Um, I've color coded the different types of slots here to help make this easier to read. So verb final language, we expect a verb to be toward the end of the clause, and that's what we find, um, it's toward the right there. The only things that occur after the verb are aspect markers and or phrase final particles. Many phrase part of final particles, as I just mentioned, incorporate aspect in them. So you may not have both. And by the way, it's not required that you have any of them. Before the verb, one thing you already know about is that we have our verbal arguments and they're in blue here, our subject, indirect object, and object. If there is a topic, um, introduced up front, that's always at the front, and so that's what you see here. And then we see that adverbs actually have a little bit of flexibility in their placement. This is partly because adverbs are just more flexible in general in the language, but also because there are different types of adverbs that do different things. So sentential adverbs are going to come towards the beginning of the phrase, and other adverbs that are more closely related to the verb, let's say like also, will occur closer to the verb. So this gives you a sense. Notice also that all of these elements before the verb can be optional. So once again, very common in Kazo to have clauses that consist of only a verb, or maybe a verb in one sort of aspect or phrase final marker. One last thing I wanna say about syntax involves pragmatics. Now you may not think that pragmatics is related to syntax closely, but in Kazo it really is. Kazo has what Bazang is called hidden complexity. Um, and this is something that we find in a number of East Asian languages. So think about languages in other parts of the world that have very um, elaborate and complex morphology and syntax. Think about, well, English fits that bill, although it's not so complex. Um, but think about Latin or think about Turkish, where you have all of this morphology that's used that really scaffolds all of the words and all of the meaning and really makes it very clear what the relationship is between all these different elements. That's very different from what we see in languages like Kadzo, which has a very simple structure. In fact, a deceptively simple structure, right? No morphology, um, lots of flexibility in word order, et cetera, makes it, um, in fact, a little harder to always understand what's going on. So, What's been pointed out in this kind of complexity, this hidden complexity, is that you have economic syntax, you have little or no morphology, and you have a small number of particles that are often multifunctional. Now, I've not stressed that very much up till now, but I can tell you that most of the grammatical particles in Kanto can occur in different constructions for different functions, meaning that any given phrase might be able to be interpreted in more than one way. And therefore you need context to really help you nail down the specific meaning in the specific moment. Um, you could think of it this way, that the syntax in Kadzo gets you part of the way there 
it narrows down your options of interpretations to maybe two or three or four, but you need context to get you all the way there to the find the right meaning that's meant in the moment. I like to say that Kadzo, in Kadzo, pragmatics does more of the heavy lifting in conveying meaning than the morphosyntax, right? So something very important to understand about this language, the way it works, and to understand the different structures that we see in the language, because there's a lot of flexibility in what's going on. You really need context to understand. So thank you for bearing with me all this time. Um, we're now ready for the case study, uh, which I think is humorous. Um, and But it is uh, does illustrate a very interesting way that language contact can create um, lexical change. Now, I've mentioned that the village of Xingmeng is in a fairly isolated part of the, villa, of the valley where it sits, and that's been true for hundreds of years. But a couple of decades ago, um, the government built a new highway through the valley, and the new highway goes right by the village of Xingmeng. And um, in fact, this has uh, created a whole new part of the village, which has popped up on the opposite side of the highway. You've got a lot of um, uh, new businesses there. You've got an open air market. You've got restaurants, karaoke bars. There's one very large restaurant that's built right on the highway and it caters to tourists. So it has a lot of different banquet rooms. And so busloads of tourists can pull up, they can have lunch. And then typically they wander around the open marketplace, buy some stuff, take photos, and then they move on. Most of the time, the tourists are Chinese, but there are foreign tourists who come through as well. In my experience, well, the year I was there, they were mostly German, but occasionally French. Um, and they would come through in the same deal. They would have lunch, they would wander around the market. Now, of course, they don't speak Mandarin typically, and no one will speak Kadzo outside of the, if they're from outside of the village. But they wanted to be polite and say they would walk around and they would buy things and they would take photos and they would say, hello, hello hello, in this very specific type of prosody that we use for people that we don't expect to understand, right? Well, it so happens that that particular prosody in English and these two syllables sound like a kadzo phrase, a kadzo phrase that has meaning. So in kadzo, this, this sounds like the kadzo phrase, hello, hello. Now, let me remind you <clears throat> that uh, Kadzo is an SOV language, so the final syllable we expect to be a verb, and that the uh, element before it we expect to be the object if it's a noun, and that because of zero anaphora, the subject may be missing, especially if it is first or second person. And so this phrase, halo, is interpreted as a noun and a verb, and the noun being an object of the verb. Now the verb, it so happens, lo, means to herd, to herd animals around. So herding goats up to the mark, up to the mountains, or herding ducks to the market. This is lo. And ha, not only is ha a noun, but it's actually an animal. It means rat. So while the tourists were wandering around saying hello, hello, as a greeting. The little old ladies who work in the market are hearing this bizarre accusation. You heard rats, you heard rats. And it didn't just happen once, right? Busload and busload after busload of Europeans showed up and kept accusing them of herding rats around. And they were really perplexed by this. They did not understand what, what was going on, why this was happening. And so this started to become a, a topic of conversation. And this um, situation started to spread throughout the village until finally someone's grandson heard this and said, no, no, no. Um, you know, at that, the grandson being of the age to have lear learned some English said, no, 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 they're being polite. This is, this is hello, this is how are you? This has nothing to do with rats. This is not kudzo. And so everyone thought this was hysterically funny. I got to say the kudzo have a very good sense of humor overall. They thought this is really funny, this misunderstanding that had come about. And so that new uh, story went around the village. As a result, this phrase, hollow, has developed a couple of new meanings. Literally, it still means to herd rats, but now it also can be used to refer to a foreigner or refer to the act of hosting a foreigner around. 
Now, I learned this phrase because I was in the village for a year and my assistant, who was local to the village, and I would walk around the village quite frequently to talk to people. Um, and it took me a while to understand that people were asking her, oh, you're herding rats today, meaning she's showing me around the village. So um, the, once I learned this phrase, I also thought it was very funny and it's become a running joke between me and all of the Kudzo. Um, it's just a fascinating example, also very humorous, um, but interesting how just the sheer randomness of the similarity between the prosody and the tone um, created this new, this new meaning to this phrase. I think it's very interesting. And just a warning, if you go to Xingmeng someday, you will undoubtedly hear this phrase being said about you. So that wraps up my uh, presentation here. I do have my abbreviations that I used on this slide. I have three pages of references uh, that you can pause and look at if you need to find a specific entry. And then I would say, if you want to know more about Kazo, if you want to see more photos of the village, if you want to hear more recordings uh, of the language, you can go to my website, kazo.net. Um, I want to thank also all of the Kazo for being such great friends and such generous research partners over the years. And then finally, I want to thank um, Nathan Hill and the Trinity Center for Asian Studies for inviting me to provide this presentation. Thank you, everyone.